what happens when we switch on the lights? What happens when we switch on the lights? Somewhere, somehow, a generator spins. A journey takes place, beginning in the coal mines, oil fields, and gas reservoirs. A complex system of processes rips apart the earth and pulls out the most used source of energy currently available to us, the fossil fuel. But the fuels are too raw. They're chemically processed, washed, dried, and pulverized. Pipelines, fleets of tractors, trucks, and ships transport this basic commodity to local power stations. The fuels are burned in pressurized boilers. A series of pipes and mechanisms transport the generated heat to modern versions of steam engines. Some fuels are gasified and ignited through gas turbines, devices similar to those that keep our airplanes afloat in the sky. And all of this culminates in a spinning generator. But that's just one journey. Electricity runs through a complex interconnected system, an incredible grid of interconnections to finally traverse the tens, if not hundreds of kilometers to reach our homes. So let me ask you again, what happens when we switch on the lights? An innocent gesture mobilizes an incredibly complex and expensive flashlight. Powered by huge industries and machineries, our generator spins, pushing out electricity just in the nick of time when we need it. A crippling of any major part of this complex interconnected system, and almost immediately, the world goes dark. We're running out of fossil fuels. So renewable technologies are a necessary part of a sustainable energy future. But they're at the mercy of nature and only work when the wind blows, the waves wave, and the sun shines. So what do we do during the dark times? What if we had a battery? This is the question that began my research into energy storage and led to an idea. You see, we don't usually store energy. The chemical batteries you and I are familiar with just aren't good enough. So I started working on a different kind of battery, a mechanical one. But like in all good research, there was a problem. I needed to build it. And like many a student before me, my pockets were empty. So I searched and searched, and searched, and searched. And finally came across a small innovation grant offered by the university. A series of coincidences and chance encounters, and I stumbled across a cheap way to build. A way to produce 3D metal parts on your desktop. Think of it a 3D metal printer the size of your desktop computer. Imagine the possibilities. Imagine. 
But today is all about connections. So before we get to the how, let's go on another journey. A few years ago, I became obsessed with trying to understand where things come from and how they're made. And I did the obvious, at least for me. I began to design and build. It started with software programming. These virtual symbols are interpreted and compiled into the language of modern computers, the binary code. The codes themselves represent signals with discrete changes in voltage. They trigger a series of digital switches whose looping interconnections form the elementary blocks of memory and arithmetic that we take for granted in computers today. So I built, I designed and built simple processors, and even more complex ones too. But under each digital building block lay an even more complex system of analog devices, transistors, diodes, capacitors, inductors, and resistors, all working together, like a complex Lego model. The combination of these three worlds, the software, digital, and analog, lead to amazing things. From the devices that power our amplifiers and speakers, to the devices that drive the motors in our appliances, to even more amazing things. To autonomous robots, oops, to autonomous robots that swim the oceans, and to artificial vision systems that perceive the world in three dimensions. But under each device lay deeper connections still. Every little building block was a composite of a huge range of materials. Wood, glass, plastic, metal, and ceramic. And so, again, I began. I started to take apart old appliances, tools, and even furniture. Much to the disappointment of my parents. I played with wood. I cut, drilled, shaved, and sanded. And before I knew it, a horrible mess became a workshop. And when you have one of those, you have to use it, don't you? <laughs> that was the beginning. I used glass melted in hot furnaces and blown into the most exquisite of shapes. Imagine a material that permeates virtually every facet of modern living, from windows, kitchenware, light bulbs, all the way to vacuum tubes, fiber optic cables, lenses, and even into those small analog devices we discussed earlier. But that wasn't the end. The more I built, the more creative and curious I became. I started working with plastics, a world of glues, resins, injection moldings, and now, 3D printing. 3D printing opened up a whole new world. But it wasn't enough. I wanted to build working machines, not just models. I needed more. I'm an engineer. I needed stronger and more precise materials. So I began working with metals. I used precision cutting tools to produce engines and motors from virtual scrap. But this was a subtractive manufacturing technique. I needed an additive process. I needed more. And so I began using ceramics to produce heat-resistant materials 
and started melting and casting metals. And now, we come full circle. A series of explorations leads to a connection between electricity, energy storage, digital analog electronics, metalworking, and 3D printing. A cheap way to produce quality 3D metal parts on your desktop. Imagine the possibilities. How does it work? The process begins with metal powders. These are combined with a special glue, plus additive, and stretched into thin wires. The wires are sometimes called filaments and are a standard material for existing 3D plastic printers. The filaments are pushed into hot nozzles controlled by a combination of software and electronics. They extrude the filament and lay it down to a flat built surface. Layer by layer by layer, a 3D model is printed. But the part is weak and will break easily. So a second process begins. Rapidly changing magnetic fields are applied. The same kind of fields that your household microwave oven produces. Bits of magnetic material embedded in the part follow the oscillating magnetic field, like miniature compass needles. And rubbing against each other, they produce friction. Within minutes, the temperature rises to 1,000 degrees. Heat-resistant ceramic materials hold the heat in, preventing catastrophic failure. The glue vaporizes, and the metal particles begin to fuse together. The result? A solid metal object. A combination of electronics and software monitor the temperature and regulate the heating to produce precise mechanical and magnetic properties. But of course, there are challenges. As with other processes, parts undergo shrinkage. A combination of special additive and software adjustments can account for this. But the high temperatures and additives also cause unexpected reactions and can potentially change metallurgical properties. But this is the beginning of a whole range of experimentation. In the lab, we're synthesizing novel materials, nanoparticles that can be printed to produce unique macro-scale structures. And you're not only limited to metals. With a special selection of additive and glue, a whole range of materials can be printed. Ceramic, glass, maybe even more. From these together, we can produce working parts and eventually working machines. From the devices that drive our appliances, the batteries that store our energy, to the generators that brighten our homes. So, now we come back to our question. What happens when we switch on the lights? Every decision, however small, connects to something bigger. These connections and our actions trigger a series of events. For a sustainable future, perhaps understanding the connections is important. For me, building things led to this understanding and fundamentally altered the way I perceive and interact with the world. Take a moment and consider. Thank you very much.